So I am joined here today by two special guests, Dr. Jillian Schmitz and Dr. Bartlett. Jillian, why don't you introduce yourself and your guest? Uh, well, thank you, Jan, for having us. It's so exciting to be in the EMRAP studio. Um, I'm Jillian Schmitz. I'm a Navy emergency physician um, working in San Diego and here with one of my residents. Hi, I'm Esther Bartlett, second year. Very excited to be here. Thank you. Welcome to the EMRAP studios. We're happy to have you here. We talked in about a really interesting case that you had. This is along the neuro variety, just to get everyone in the right frame of mind. So why don't you tell us the story of this patient that came to your ED that presented a bit of a diagnostic challenge? So this was an evening shift, so usually the, one of the busiest times in the emergency department. I think it was like 9 o'clock at night. And I was working in the main emergency department side, and a triage nurse came running up to me for concern for a code stroke in the waiting room. And she told me they had a 41-year-old male who came in with a headache and some vision changes, and she was very concerned that he had some facial asymmetry. So I immediately ran out to the waiting room to go eyeball this patient and, and worry, do we call the code stroke? Because this was a night like most emergency departments where we have no beds in the ED. We are completely gridlocked. And do I need to call a code stroke and make an extra bed or move someone else out of the queue to kind of prioritize this? And I immediately look at him and he looks very well, 41 year old, like pretty healthy guy and just eyeballing him through the plexiglass. Uh, he had normal vital signs and he's complaining of a minor headache and some vision changes. And you can immediately notice there's some asymmetry and I can understand why the nurses were worried about a potential stroke. But when I asked him to puff out his cheeks and to smile, it, his lower two thirds of his face was completely normal. But there was something quite about his eye that wasn't quite right. And his eyelid was definitely drooping, but it was hard to get a good exam in triage. And so I asked to pull him into a different room where there was slightly different lighting that I could see him a little better. And when we pulled him in, I could see that his his eye was was sagging. There was definitely a little bit of a ptosis there, but it was it was subtle, it, but it was clearly asymmetric. And as I moved him out of triage where the light was a little bit different, you could see there was some asymmetry to his pupils. And it was his right eye that was sort of drooping. And his right eye, I would say, was three to four millimeters, and the left was five to six. Mm. But other than that, he seemed to have a pretty normal neurologic exam. And so that first question is, is this really a stroke? Do I pull the trigger on a code stroke? I think this is more of a, of a Horner syndrome where this could be a lot of things, but I, I don't know that we need the resources to, to call a code stroke right away. But that was the first kind of question of, of really getting a good neuro exam and trying to get more time sensitive information to know if you pull that trigger right away. I think these are always really interesting cases. Code strokes are routine for us. We call them a lot, but they're very resource intensive, especially on the kind of shift that you're describing, which is now am I going to hold the CT scanner for this patient, call a neurologist to the bedside, make a bed, kick someone out of a bed to put this patient in? Am I sure that this is really what's going on? It's it's a lot that ask, especially through plexiglass. I mean, that's <laughs> a whole other aspect of it that's really challenging. Um, so I, it sounds like you made a good call here, but now I think Esther comes into the story, doesn't she? Well, I pulled her in a minute, but after I got a first exam, I, I tried to see what else was the really the history here of what's going on. And it, interestingly, like many of our patients, he would never have come to the emergency department. His wife made him come in. right? <laughs> yeah. um, and she was concerned about the way his face looked. He told me he is a search and rescue guy. He jumps out of helicopters about 20 feet and they had done an exercise yesterday, but nothing out of the normal. He wasn't having any pain. It didn't hurt. He didn't fall funny went home the night before and had a mild headache, but like maybe three or four out of 10. So nothing that really concerned him enough. Next day, went to sleep, didn't think anything of it. The next day he wakes up, still has a headache, but now more eye pain. And he describes it as difficulty seeing to the point where he was holding his sweatshirt up over his eye to be able to see the TV, which was kind of weird. Um, and he had a hard time describing this. And this is where I think the code stroke gets a little difficult is, does he have any other neuro symptoms? And he described really it was more pain, um, but it was also like the sensation of like my face doesn't feel quite right, but yet subjectively, and when I pressed on his face, he could feel it fine. So he could move everything, but he has this ptosis, he's got unequal pupils, and he has this kind of pain, maybe paresthesias. So in my head, his NIH stroke scale is, is maybe a one at best. So, and this has been going on for more than 24 hours. So I felt pretty comfortable saying, I don't think we need to activate the stroke team. We don't need to give lytics, but something's clearly going on. And because our waiting room, like many of us with kind of overcrowding and boarding, I can't get labs. I can put in orders for imaging of, you know, what, what can I order to kind of get things started? 
And as I'm going through my mind of, of Horner syndrome and, and recognizing that I have to go grab one of my residents because this is kind of a cool case and there's so many different things that can cause kind of Horner syndrome, but you know, what can I get immediately? And maybe it's just from med school, the way that we're taught those buzzwords of, of Horner syndrome. The first thing that popped into my mind was pancose tumor. It's just like <laughs> biz buzz, like something that jumps into my head when I think of Horner's. Um, so I ordered a non-con head CT and a chest X-ray just to sort of get things started while in the waiting room. And at this point, I grabbed uh, Dr. Bartlett as one of my PGY2s to come take a look and asking her, what do you think's the differential as I'm like rapidly looking through my phone of what is the differential <laughs> diagnosis for Horner syndrome? Um, and at that point, Esther got to do a little bit more of a physical exam. Yeah. So I like walk in and I just stand there because I'm so excited. This is my first Horner syndrome. And I tell him, we're going to take good care of you, but I want you to know I will be fangirling over this case. <laughs> um, super cool dude, 41, really otherwise healthy, has no medical problems whatsoever. And when he's sitting there in the bed, he looks well and he doesn't look under distress, which is also good. Um, so I do a full neurologic exam and he has no neurofocal deficits whatsoever. It really is just that significant right eyelid drooping and the ptosis, um, which you can see better now that he's back in a room. He's um, being able to worked up, be worked up appropriately. And so um, I'm trying to think about what could this be so I have the opportunity to get more of a history from him. And yeah, he's been um, search and rescue for 20 years. Wow. They jump out of helicopters that are 20 to 40 feet off of the water um, and they love their job. And he had a friend there in the room too and they were joking about how the helmet felt a little bit weird two days ago, um, but at this time there's no pain whatsoever. And his headache at this point, maybe a one out of 10, he barely even mentions it. Um, um, he doesn't have the paresthesia by the time I get there, and objectively, sensation is intact. Um, and so I just got to spend a few more minutes with them, get the history, and then I walk out, and I'm thinking, okay, what is Dr. Schmitz going to ask about? What do I need to know about? Um, and so I did a little bit of research on up to date on Horner syndrome, and every single article said that if there was any kind of neck pain, you have to get neck imaging. But this guy had no neck pain. He had nothing except for those two findings. Um, but with the story about the helmet and just how long he's been doing search and rescue and how much of a toll that can take on the body, I told her, I was like, we got to get neck imaging. Um, we have a negative x-ray. We have a negative CT head. We have to check the neck. 